Hello, and welcome to another episode of our Primary Source Close Read. My name is Josh, and today I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Josh Dunnigan here. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Supreme Court case of Hazelwood School District at the Kuhlmeyer. Josh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So this case is a uh, freedom of the press case, and the Bill of Rights Institute is going to be releasing a homework help video on the topic of freedom of the press. And in conjunction with that, we wanted to create this video to take a look at some excerpts from the court case for students who are going to be studying this case in either their government or civics class. So hopefully by looking at these excerpts, we can really get to the heart of what is, as all Supreme Court cases are, they can be a bit overwhelming, confusing for students. So what we're gonna try and do here is just get to the heart of what are the constitutional questions um, at hand in this case. So let's go ahead and dive in. So let's start off with our general constitutional question here of the case. So does the First Amendment's protection for freedom of the press apply to student school newspapers? So Josh, um, the First Amendment, of course, reads that uh, Congress cannot prohibit freedom of the press. Why did the founders include that in the First Amendment? Well, because the press is really the best way for individuals to broadcast their messages to larger groups of people. So the press really in the First Amendment, it doesn't mean the institutional press like the New York Times or uh, a local newspaper, local television station. It really means a technology. So whatever technology is available for broadcasting your message, that's the primary meaning of, of the press there. And they wanted to ensure that individuals would have access to it to be able to, to get their message out and the government couldn't interfere with that. Great. Yeah. And um, another important term here that that's related to freedom of the press that is going to come up here in this case of Hazelwood is prior restraint, um, which is the power of the government to prevent the publication of information. So um, what could you dive in a bit more into what is prior restraint? So the doctrine of no prior restraint is a bedrock principle of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And the idea is that the government cannot prevent you from saying something before you say it. Uh, now, originally, particularly as it emerged out of England and English common law, uh, you could be punished after the fact. Uh, so for instance, in England, they had this thing called seditious libel, where you could be punished for saying things that were critical or disrespectful of the government. And we even had a similar law here for a short time in the United States with the, with the Sedition Act. But even under that, there was no, the, the government couldn't come in prior to you saying something critical about the government and say, we heard that you're gonna criticize us, so we're gonna seize your printing press. Uh, but there was this idea that you could punish it after the fact. There's a big debate oh, with the Sedition Act over whether or not that provided a sufficient protection for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. I think the American people largely said no, uh, but it still remains a fundamental and bedrock principle of freedom of speech. That is, you would call it a necessary, but perhaps not sufficient condition for freedom of speech and press. Great. Yeah, and as, as we're going to get into the case, we're going to see this comes up. It, as you said, it's, it's been really well decided that the government cannot do that to the press. But then the question is going to be, well, can, can a school do that for a student right. newspaper? Can they come in and prevent a, um, a student from publishing a certain article? That's what the question is, is going to be. Right. Um, and one more final important a uh, piece of background that we should dive in here is the case of Tinker v. Des Moines. Um, what happened here and why should we understand that before we get into Hazelwood? All right, so Tinker is a landmark decision involving student speech rights in K-12 education. And famously, uh, some students wanted to wear black armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. The school uh, punished them for this wanted to punish them for it, and it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, as the quote here uh, says, uh, said that the students don't surrender uh, their rights at the uh, schoolhouse gate. Now, the Supreme Court did say, in the opinion, that student speech rights could still be restricted 
uh, in K through 12 education because of the nature of K through 12 education. So there were two important restrictions that they would allow. That is speech that would disrupt the educational process provide a, create a substantial disruption to the educational process or would violate the rights of others. Uh, but this ends up being this bedrock principle. And so for a while, you see courts following and tinker, lower courts expanding student speech rights uh, in K through 12 education. So in, in the 1970s, I think you would say that this was really the, the high watermark for judicial protection of student speech rights in uh, K through 12 education. Okay. Great. So let's actually look at the, the actual case then. So give me some background information of what happened um, in the lead up before this became a court case. Okay, so in the 1980s, you do see courts starting to pull back a little bit. And you see this with two important cases in the 19, 1980s on, on student speech. Uh, the first one was called Bethel versus Frazier, and it was shortly before Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer. And in this case, the Supreme Court said that schools could, could punish lewd or lascivious speech. Uh, and then you get to Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer, and you see the court announcing another restriction. I think what these cases illustrate is that courts had grown a little bit concerned about their ability to regulate and monitor student speech in schools, and they had perhaps become a little bit more sympathetic to uh, school officials who were trying to maintain order so that the learning process could uh, proceed in the way it needed to proceed. Uh, so I think that's important background for understanding is that you do see starting in the 1980s, uh, lower courts, but then also the Supreme Court being a little bit less um, protective of student speech rights. Great. Yeah. So so what exactly happened here? Why, why did this specific school district believe that it needed to step in and, and quote unquote, infringe on a student. Yes. So what happened is that you had a, a student newspaper and they wanted to publish two articles that the principal of the school was concerned about. Uh, one article involved teenage pregnancy and then another involved divorce. And the article on teenage pregnancy, I believe, discussed three students. Even though the names were changed, the principal was concerned that they could, you could still identify who they were. Uh, and that there was some material in that that would be inappropriate for younger students who might read the newspaper. Uh, and then the article concerning divorce, they actually interviewed a, a particular student, and they, at least as it was initially written, they had not changed uh, the name. And there were some things said about um, the uh, student's father that the principal was concerned about publishing, and perhaps that the, the parents should have been able to weigh in as well. So the principal had uh, concerns about those two articles and refused to let the student newspaper publish them. Okay. And so how did the Supreme Court end up ruling that? So the Supreme Court ended up ruling in favor of the school and the principal. Uh, what the Supreme Court said was that schools uh, can still control student newspapers. And if they control it, that is, if it's school-sponsored speech, um, it remains fully within their power to regulate uh, what articles are published in, it, uh, in, in the student newspaper. Another way of putting that is that if a principal has not declared that the student newspaper is a public forum, uh, that the principal or other school officials can still regulate the content of, of this, the school newspaper. Uh, this only applies to K through 12 education though. It doesn't apply to college uh, newspapers. Sometimes uh, universities have gotten in trouble by reading this opinion and thinking that it extends to them. It does not. It was only because this was in uh, a high school. So again, K through 12, K through 12 education. So really, what principals uh, do, and I think most of them would do in light of Hazelwood uh, versus Kuhlmeyer, is say that the school newspaper is not a public forum, and therefore we retain the right uh, to control what gets published in it. So here we have an excerpt from the majority opinion written by Justice Byron White. Um, and what I think stands out to me here that's important is He's going to use this phrase here, uh, legitimate ped pedagogical concerns. Um, and so I think you mentioned in, in Tinker, the court ruled that, that the, the school is able to do some things to suppress student speech if it does mm -hmm. get in the way of something like this. Is that correct? Right. So in, in Tinker, if there's uh, speech that would create a substantial disruption, uh, they can uh, censor or punish it. And they, also any speech that violates uh, the rights of others. Uh, and so here they have this caveat, legitimate ped pedagogical concerns. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, most of the time, uh, principals can principals or school officials can ar articulate a legitimate pedagogical concern for any any articles that they think are uh, inappropriate for the uh, uh, for the student body to read. And then uh, moving on, here's a, another quote that we have here um, from the from the um, majority opinion, and he's going to say that. Uh, we, we cannot reject as unreasonable what the principal did. Um, so he's here, he's kind of deferring to what the school official did as opposed to deferring to, to student speech rights. Is that a fair way of characterizing this? He's kind uh, of absolutely, absolutely. Again, yeah, this is, a, this is a case that gives greater latitude to school officials to exercise their judgments about what's appropriate in, uh, a, student, in a student newspaper. And they aren't going to defer to the, you know, if, again, if the principal, e even if the students say, well, we think that there are good reasons to publish that, this, uh, if the principal uh, or other school officials think that the, the, the concerns outweigh those, um, the principal is generally going to win. Right. Yep. And, and it's this idea that, again, um, it's kind of this idea that students have, haven't quite yet reach the point where they can exercise their First Amendment rights to the full extent as adults. Um, so it's kind of this idea that maybe schools, you do have certain rights, correct, as students, but, um, but given the format of school and the purpose of school, it is still different from what, uh, what other people outside of school adults would have for First Amendment rights. Right. It's just, it's just the nature of K through, uh, K through 12 education. Yeah, it extends no farther than that and only to public schools as well. <laughs> so, uh, of course, private schools exercise, uh, um, can exercise uh, immense authority over what gets published in their paper, but the First Amendment doesn't apply to them. There was a, um, I believe, three justices dissented. Is that correct? It was a five to three decision. Um, so Justice William Brennan, he wrote the dissenting opinion, and he's actually going to also use that phrase legitimate pedagogical purposes here in the first sentence. Um, but uh, what does he conclude? Why does he think that this actually does not get in the way of legitimate pedagogical purposes? Right. So I think for William Brennan, one of the things that is important is that students learn to understand the nature of the First Amendment and freedom of speech and freedom, freedom of press. And so that's part of the uh, educational purpose of public schools is to uh, uh, create citizens. And this is this would be uh, an important part of this. And I think for William Brennan, there is simply a default setting, which is that the, the First Amendment, as you see in that very last line, permits no such blanket censorship authority, that part of that is, it's just that that's his default setting, regardless of where this uh, the speech uh, speech occurs, whether in a, a K through 12 setting or, or outside of it. Uh, so yes, he's obviously dissatisfied with, with the majority uh, in, in this case. And he thinks that uh, it actually undermines the educational mission of the school or schools to allow uh, principals and school officials to engage in this kind of regulation of content in student newspapers. Right. And Brennan isn't necessarily saying, again, that like schools can't uh, stop any type of speech. He just, he, he recognizes it's probably, you know, it's a bit of a gray area to some extent. There's always going to be different hypothetical cases. And he even throws out here um, a hypothetical case of what if the student says socialism is good um, in response to a question? Does that subvert right. the legitimate mission um, of schools to, you know, maybe promote capitalism? Um, and so he, he recognizes there are these gray areas, but he seems to be more inclined to defer to student free speech rather oh, than referring to the administration. So... Then let's go back to our, our final or our uh, general constitutional question here. Does the First Amendment's protections for freedom of the press apply to student school newspapers? So if you could summarize in 30 seconds to a minute, how would you answer that question? 
No, they don't, as long as the school officials have not declared that the school newspaper is a public forum. If they've done that, and if officially have officially announced it, or perhaps uh, you, you could imagine there being a case where through inaction or officially uh, uh, stating that they retain the right to uh, exercise editorial control that students might be able to successfully sue. But by and large, um, schools retain broad authority uh, to regulate the content of student newspapers. Great. And then I think one common question that comes up on people's minds when they hear that, what about say like college newspapers? Is this stock at high school or does this- Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this does not extend to college newspapers. Yeah. This is just K through 12 education. Any university official who tries to cite this as a justification for censorship of the college newspaper should prepare to be sued and to lose. Um, that's that's uh, what that that's uh, that's what would happen. Um, yeah. So it's only because this is K through 12 education. The, the Supreme Court has just been willing to to say that um, the circumstances are different. Uh, <clears throat> the Students are young, um, and so they'll allow some regulations that otherwise uh, they would never allow uh, outside of uh, K through 12 schools. Sure. And in the modern day, what is the what's been happening with student free speech and free expression? Yeah. So there are really five cases in total uh, addressing student speech in K through 12 education. We've discussed three: Tinker, uh, Bethel versus Fraser, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer. Then you have Morse versus Frederick. And in that case, the Supreme Court said that schools could censor pro-drug speech. Uh, and then just from the Supreme Court's last term, there's Monoy versus BL. Uh, looks like it's pronounced Mahanoy, but it's actually Monoy. And in that case, the Supreme Court addressed off-campus speech uh, because with the rise of the internet, there have been increasing questions about whether or not schools could punish or censor off-campus speech that then might uh, have an effect on the in school environment. That is, could off campus speech, which creates a substantial disruption in school, can, uh, can school officials punish and censor that? We've been waiting for really 10 to 15 years for the Supreme Court to announce a decision on that. And the, the core of the Supreme Court's de decision is that um, only in very rare circumstances uh, could schools punish or censor students off campus speech. So those are the five cases Tinker, Bethel, Hazelwood, uh, Morse versus Frederick, and Monoy versus BL. All right, well, thank you so much, Josh, for joining us on this uh, close read. So you can join our conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates on programs, events, and ways to get involved. And we'd also love to hear from you. So please comment your thoughts on the video below or get in touch with us on social media. As I mentioned earlier, we will be releasing a new homework help video on the freedom of the press, that principle, why it's important, the history of it, and how the Supreme Court has been interpreting it throughout our history. So Josh, thank you again for joining us for this discussion. Thanks for having me. It was great to be with you again.